Hey everyone, Justin here from Cold Legion Gaming. Today I'm going to be bringing you the first video in a short series regarding the game Bolt Action. So, why are we doing a short series on Bolt Action? Um, Bolt Action has been around for quite a while, it's on version 2 of it. Uh, but up our way, it hasn't really taken off a whole lot, so we just started playing it. So when we go gaming at different stores and locations, we get asked quite often, what's it about, what size, points, dollar amount, that kind of stuff. So we decided to make a short video so people can actually um, get a how-to um, by some people that they may be playing in the future. Also, I've noticed from doing some browsing and searching that on all those videos on how-to for Bolt Action Game System, they're usually like an hour, hour and a half, two hours. So we wanted to break it down into a short series. Um, most likely it's going to be five videos, 15 to 20 to 30 minutes long. <clears throat> the first one here is going to be a short intro, how to play basic supplies, that kind of stuff. Uh, we're going to have one on moving, we're going to have one on shooting, one on assaulting, and then probably a fifth video just to kind of clean up anything that was missing. This way, as you're learning the system, as you're playing, if you have a quick question on, oh, how do I do this in movement, or what do I need to do for shooting in this scenario, you can quick pop up a short 30-minute video and kind of filter through instead of trying to skim through an entire two-hour video on that. So as I said, um, we're most likely looking at five short series, um, hoping to post them up within a time period of a couple weeks, max of a month, as I get rolling here with them. Um, so this way you can get in there and see what the game system is all about, how to play. Uh, now the system will not cover every tiny little in the weeds detail, um, but it's going to cover the majority of that kind of stuff so you get a good feel for the game system. Um, and then as we go through, uh, I'll be quoting different pages from the rule book, so you can kind of follow along. Uh, this is good for if you've played Bolt Action for a while. I've been playing since about March. Uh, it's now September. Um, and I still forget some things as most people do in game systems. So this will kind of give those those people that have been playing maybe a, a quick good fresh reminder and those that are just coming along um, give you a good basis for starting to roll dice and play the game. So what is Bolt Action? Bolt Action is a 28 millimeter World War II historical rule set system. Uh, it is played at the platoon level where uh, as you have Flames of War which is played at a company size or you have a game like Chain of Command that's played at a squad size this is played at the platoon size, so it's usually led by a platoon leader, a uh, lieutenant usually, uh, with a couple infantry squads, and then you'll have some support units that may be anywhere from a one-man to a two-man to a five-man, whatever it may be. Um, and then you can have the option to take an armored car and a tank, but it's mainly infantry-based. Uh, but I have a small smattering down here you can see of what would be considered a unit in the system. Here we have a lieutenant who would be leading the actual platoon, so that would be your commander. You have a sniper man, or sniper two man team, excuse me, a machine gun, which would be three man, a BT 42 tank, and an infantry squad consisting of nine guys for this squad. Um, so that gives you an idea of what they're talking about when it consider a unit. A one man here, or like the, the tank or the lieutenant, could be considered a unit when uh, referencing the rules and things of that nature. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more. So, the rule system is created by Warlord Games. Um, it's a great rule set. As I said, the system is a historical World War II. They do make two different supplements for this system. The first one is called Conflict 47. So if you like that sci-fi kind of blend feel, Conflict 47, you'll have walkers, you'll have zombies, you'll have werewolves, you'll have all that kind of stuff that gives you that extra feel into it. But it uses the same rule set, it just is a supplement on how to use those certain things. There's also a game system out there, or a supplement, I should say, I'm sorry, called uh, Tanks. If you like playing just tanks, as some people do, and don't want to deal with all the infantry, Tanks is that supplement you'll need, where you can throw down four or five tanks on each side and have just an armored battle. And again, it uses the same rule system, so it's great, same models. It just gives you those extra supplemental rules where you can actually build a campaign and have characters that beef up as the games go on and so on and so forth as other game systems do. So it gives you that option. But mainly, this is what you're looking at. It's a platoon-based game. Uh, it is played on a standard 6x4 table. Again, some places you'll go to when you scale down, you can play at any point size. And the books do have uh, a point system for each unit when you build. That'll tell you how many points it's worth. Uh, if you're playing a smaller game, you can play on a 4x4 table. Um, I know some tournaments play that until you get to about 
800, um, 750, 800, and then once you get to that scale and you start to get to 1,000, 1,250, on, so on and so forth, you go to a 6x4, you can play at any size, but the standard seems to be a 6x4 playing table for your standard size games. So now that we know what it is, what do you need to actually play the game? So of course you need the rule book. You've got a nice hardcover rule book here uh, that goes through all the basic rules and missions, and it does have in the back a little bit on certain the more popular forces um, or armies, I guess you can call them, of US, Germany, Great Britain, that kind of thing. So obviously you need the rule book. Then you will have to the right here, you're going to see your army book. So depending what force you decide to choose with, these are your books you're going to need to play. So for instance, here's the one for Great Britain. It'll take you through, see some nice Osprey, or that's not Osprey, it's some nice Osprey pictures and everything in here. But it's going to take you through how to actually build your list, a little bit of brief description on them, what they have with them and everything like that. So this obviously you will need for depending on what army you take. This is Great Britain's. There's ones there for Italy and all your minor Axis armies are, are covered in one book. So they're not going to obviously put out a book just for, say, I play Finnish. They're not going to put out a whole book for a smaller minor Axis party like that. They just combine them in there. So you'll need a supplement rule book. You will need some type of measuring device, a tape measure, measuring stick. These work great too. The rule set is in inches. Um, so just be aware of that. But of course, you're going to need your handy dandy tape measure. You're going to need a template. Um, and again, you don't need this, but of course your mortars, artillery, things of that nature that do a template damage, um, you'll need something to measure. You could always measure from the center of the thing out, but this is a handy template that Warlord Games sells. You have an inch, you have your two inch, you have your three inch, and you have your four inch. So it covers all the templates that you would need. Um, and you get that with that. Also, you'll get these tokens and they're going to be kind of hard to see in here, but so you have tokens for uh, hidden, you have tokens, they're all hidden, of course I grabbed, but hit tokens for hidden, tokens for if your turret jams, if your tank is immobilized, that kind of stuff. That all comes on one sprue you can get through Warlord games. Um, so it's handy to have, is it absolutely necessary to play the game? No. Um, next we're going to get to here, so this system, and I'm going to explain this here in a little bit further in this video, uses a pin system, so as units get hit, they get pin markers, makes it harder for them to... Uh, take commands, fire, that kind of stuff. So you need something for that. Um, a good old dice next to it with how many pins they have work. Um, there's companies out there that make these nice little wheels. So you can get whatever army you're playing, spin it to put a pin marker next to them. Again, whatever you use so you identify it. Dice work just as well. You just got to be careful to remember what they're there for. Um, and that you don't scoop them up accidentally and forget about them there. Um, and then you'll need some of the missions call for objective markers. You can use anything. You can make homemade terrain, little pieces. Um, these, again, are made by the same company that made them for me, so you can put these down. As long as you have something to identify the objective, any size really works. As long as you're, you and your opponent agree on something, um, and you can throw it down. So again, whatever you have there. Of course, it uses D6 dice for all your rolls. Um, just like any other roll system out there, there will be times where you're rolling D3. So obviously, you take the d dice and you half it. There's times when you're actually rolling a D2, I believe. So 1 through 3 is a 1, 4 through 6 is a 2, that kind of stuff. Um, so your standard D6 dice. And then lastly, this is something we're going to go into detail in a little bit. And this is what makes this game system so cool to me. You have what's called order dice. That will have these different orders on them. Run, rally, fire, down. We'll go through all these a little bit. You do need a pack of these. Warlord Games does sell them anywhere from 12 to 20 bucks, depending where you get them on sale and everything like that. Um, they, obviously, you can see they come in different colors. We'll go into that in a little bit here of exactly why that is. Um, you only need one pack to play. I personally strongly recommend getting two, simply because if you and your opponent show up and you have the same color dice, it's going to make it very difficult. But you do definitely need the activation dice to be able to play. And finally, so you'll need something to put the activation dice in. And a rule specified, and by the way, the basic supply list that they talk about it is in page 27 of the rule book if you're following along. Then you need some type of bag. Um, this is made by Warlord Games. They make ones for different armies. This is an Italian one. Um, a cup that you can't see into, a paper bag. It doesn't really matter. 
You just need something to, as you're playing the system, we'll explain that you can put all the activation dice into to pick out of as you're playing. So you will need something along those lines. Um, again, if you don't want to spend the money on one of their bangs, you can find felt dice bags pretty cheap. You could do it in a giant coffee mug as long as you're not looking in when you're pulling dice. So that is the basic supplies. So of course, you will need an army. Uh, again, Warlord Games does have a website. They have a great army builder site or system where you can actually go in and pick what country you want to play and then go in line by line and choose your headquarters, your infantry troops, your support squads. And it comes to about 120 bucks. It's a great starter army. You can also piecemeal it. You can find this stuff on other sites. I mean, it's everywhere. It's a pretty popular system. So, of course, you do need an army to play. Um, and again, it can range you anywhere from, you know, I've seen people build an army at 900 or 900 points for like 90 bucks on up to 150, 160 bucks. This is one of the cheaper systems that I've played. It's great. I bought everything for my finished stuff for about 140 bucks and I'm at like 2,500 points. So it's a great cheap system. Um, so yeah, but you can find that stuff anywhere. All right, we're going to take a brief moment real quick here and talk about the different types of units and some uh, rules regarding them while playing the game. For those following along in the rule book, uh, we're on page 35 here. So different types of units, it breaks it down into three main categories, um, and that covers a wide base of things. So you obviously have um, your infantry units. They could be anything, again, as we discussed, from a two-man team to a... Uh, one man team to a complete squad. So basically anything on foot obviously is considered infantry. This also pertains to infantry units that may be on bicycle, uh, motorcycle, cav, uh, that kind of stuff. They, they consider them infantry. So anytime they're talking about infantry, they're talking about them. Um, so basically, obviously anything on foot. Now, it also breaks it down. Slide these guys out of the way to artillery. So anytime they're talking about artillery because there are special rules. So here we have what's considered a medium howitzer in the, in the, uh, the game, crewed by a four-man team. So when they're talking about artillery, they're talking about anything um, of a large caliber or uh, fixed. So like a medium mortar is considered artillery. Um, it has a three-man crew um, and it's considered a fixed weapon. So, of a large caliber, fires, indirect fire, so it counts as artillery for this rule set. Um, and then vehicles. Vehicles can be anything from a transport truck to a armored car to a tank. Self-explanatory. Anything that is tracked, wheeled, vehicle-esque is considered a vehicle. Um, and then there will be special rules, and we'll get into it for wheeled vehicles to half-tracked vehicles. I'm sorry, this is a fully tracked vehicle. Two half tracked vehicles where I want to go to, and I don't have any of those to show you. But anything like that's obviously considered to be a vehicle. Normally, vehicles are a one, uh, whatever you want to call it, model unit. Um, so you're only ever going to see when talking about a unit with a vehicle, it's one model. So that's basically the three main categories. Um, that they talk about. Now we want to talk a little bit about basing. Um, start since I got a vehicle right in front of me. Some people like to put their vehicles on bases. Uh, it gives them that little bit more of a, a, a look that they can model the bases around them. You're more than welcome to. You do not have to with vehicles. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but you can. Infantry obviously are based on a single base. Uh, Warlord Games does provide plastic bases when you get the guys. Um, I use a different company just because they're a little sturdier, but infantry are, are based on a single model. Um, now, let's get talking about basing, specifically with crew teams. So here we have an MMG, medium machine gun. It's a three-man crew. By the rules, you would actually base these, your machine gunner on one base, and then your crewmen on two separate bases. So you actually have three bases for the machine gun. You do not need to do that. The rule system even says you can base them all on one if you like. It is your preference. But you have to remember when this is being shot at by a template weapon, say for instance, my artillery, if it's being fired on a template weapon, the template goes on the piece. 
So if you got the guys spread out within your, your one inch allotted gap properly, and we'll get into that in a little bit, there's less chance of them all getting hit. If I clump them all together right next to each other like this, they're all getting hit by pretty much a one inch, two inch on up base. Um, so it is preference. I prefer to put them all on one base. It makes it easier for moving. Um, yeah, I like the kind of diorama aspect of it. Um, I got a buddy that plays who does when they're moving, he has them all on a separate base carrying the gun and, and then once they're set up so he knows they're actually firing and again we'll get into that in movement and shooting and all when it comes to fixed weapons um then he puts you know this base down so he knows that they haven't moved that turn and they can shoot um so again it is personal preference of whatever you like uh but they basically say that um a 25 uh, millimeter round base for infantry um are good 25 to 50 for an oblong base if so if you got a prone model you can use that um and then of course the guns and again i've seen some people put this artillery on just one little base where the wheels are on it and the the actual stabilizing legs are just sitting on the table like so an oblong coming this way and then the crew around it however you want to base it is up to you um the rules are kind of flexible about that it works out again the issue with basing them all on one like this is if this crew takes wounds I obviously can't remove a model, whereas you can if they're on a single basis. So that's kind of one negative. Um, so, like most systems you play, you play 40k or whatever the case may be that have models with multiple wounds. You just put a dice on it, stating how many crew you've lost or how many are left, whatever your preference is. Um, and you can do it that way again as long as you're keeping track, because there are negative modifiers in the game as you get down to uh, one crewman. So you're down to one. It's obviously harder for him to operate this entire piece. So. Um, obviously you have to keep track of that basing that is completely up to you so let's talk a little bit about what to consider to be a formation in the unit and that obviously is just talking about unit coherency so we have a squad of nine right here boom they're moving forward they're doing whatever the case may be they have to be within a one inch gap of each other all right that's pretty self-explanatory you can't have some guys operating over here and see, I killed a guy. Operating over here and say that that's one squad. They have to stay within one inch coherency. Now, just like other rule systems, you could spread them out really if you want to, to expand that gap. And that's perfectly okay, as long as they are within one inch of each other. Now, say you take some heavy fire and for whatever reason, for tactic purposes, or if you have mixed weapons in here and you don't want to take those good weapons, you take these two guys, these two guys die. Well, now you have two guys sitting over here that are out of coherency. So at the next possible time, they need to move into coherency. So if that's say they're end of the turn, at the beginning of their next turn, you want to stand and shoot with these guys. You can't, they have to make a move to get back into coherency. So at the next possible moment, next possible opportunity, they must get back into coherency. So they always have to stay within one inch of each other pretty simple. Um, the other side of that is if you have two units operating side by side, I got a two man sniper squad here, there must always be a one inch gap in between those two units. I cannot tighten these guys up and put them right next to it. Same thing with the machine gun, same thing with the vehicle. There always must be a one inch gap between units. And honestly, that does help quite a bit when you're trying to determine what squads go to what. <laughs> especially if you got multiple squads pushing forward in one, one spot, there has to be one inch gap. That goes for friend or foe. At no time can you come within a one inch gap of a friendly unit or an enemy unit. Obviously, charging is an exception to that, and we'll get into that with assaulting. But at the end of that assault, there's fallback rules. You must always be at least one inch away from a foe. Where that plays a part, and especially with an enemy when assaulting, and I've had this happen and, and learned my lesson, is... Some rule system is, is if this was an enemy unit and I assault them and I kill them and there's another enemy unit right here and I do my consolidation move, you can't pile into another unit. You must end within one inch of that unit. So other rule systems allow you to do that. I'm not going to go into all that, but so you can't pile in and keep continuing down the line. You must always stay within one inch away from friend or foe. So that's very basic uh, stuff. It, it's all covered again on page 35 if you have the rule book and you're following along. Um, again, basing gets a little obscured there, but the, the system allows you to determine how you want to play that out, which 
personally, I think is a good thing because uh, then it's more of a modeling aspect of what you like. So uh, that's it. We're going to move on to the next section here. All right. Now we're going to talk about, uh, I guess you can call it the meat of the game system. Um, one of the rules that, that they do here that I really like about this game system, we're going to talk about the order dice. I just said, so Warlord Games sells these are a pack of 12. They are six-sided dice, and they have these different commands on them. Unlike other game systems where one opponent or one person will go through a movement, a shooting, an assaulting, or they each have two activation points that they can do, and you pick a guy, and he can do two different things, and, and then once they're done, they go to the next person. Warlord Games uses a random activation system using these activation dice. The way that works is... For every unit you have, you get one activation dice. So if you have 11 units, you will have 11 activation dice. The opponent has only 7 because they have more elite units, they will only have 7. So every unit gets an activation dice. Now, what happens is, as I said, you have this handy dandy little bag here. All dice, there are some exceptions, and we'll get into that later, but for the basic of it, all dice go into the bag. Now, at the beginning of turn one, you randomly reach into the bag. Now, whoever's dice that is, this is the brown one, which we had determined was the Brits here. Whoever's dice it is gets to activate one unit with whatever they decide to do with that unit. And we'll get into that in a little bit here, exactly what each of these means. Um, and then some of these are really going to be covered in some of these other videos. But whatever it is, he activates the commandos does whatever he's going to do with them whatever he puts face down that's him once that's done you reach in and pull out another one this would be a finish they do what they're going to do you reach in and pull another one churchill well this is going back and forth this works out well um and then once you get to the end now there's only two of these in here so they would activate these two once all dice are pulled from the bag that is the end of that turn all dice, with some exceptions, and we'll get into that again, to be continued, as I keep saying, will go back into the bag. That starts turn two. So it's very random. It gives it that extra feel of you really need to pick and choose what you want to do. Do I want to fire this armored car at them before they get a chance to shoot and kill these guys? Or is that tank a bigger threat? You really have to determine, and it gives in my opinion, a whole nother depth and level to the, the playing system because you don't know what's going to happen next. And frankly, I love it. It is awesome. Um, so that's kind of how the random activation works. You'll see it as we go on further on. Um, but I'm going to actually get into here what those dice actually say, each six sides, and what you can do with those options next. Okay, so let's take a closer look at these activation dice, or order dice as they're called, um, and what you can do with each one. Now, I'm not going to go into detail with some of these, because some of these pertain specifically, obviously, to the movement video, or the firing shooting video that I'm going to be posting later on down the road. Um, but I just want to give a quick, brief overview of what each of these does. So we'll start to left to right here. So the fire, the order dice. Obviously, if you want your unit to shoot, this is what you're going to use. Um, this will be covered in detail in the shooting video, so I'm not going to say a whole lot to it about here, except if you want your unit to go bang bang, that's what they're going to be doing. Pretty self-explanatory. <clears throat> Advancing. Same thing, if you want your unit to move, um, whether it be vehicle, infantry, whatever the case may be, this is your advance, this is your movement die. So that's the order you would put down with that. Um, again, we'll be covered more in the movement video. Pretty self-explanatory, again, along with the run. And again, I'm not going into brief, a whole lot of detail about this. Again, this video, guys, just is a quick overview of everything. Um, I'm hoping you like what you hear, and you'll stick around to the other videos and give it a check out. So this is a run order. So it's pretty much the same exact thing as an advance. An advance is going to be your half movement, and a run is going to be, I should say, this is this is one distance, and then this is a greater distance, usually double, I shouldn't say half, but um, each one has some restrictions. Each one allows you to do certain things after you move the units, which will be covered under the movement video. Ambush. 
Another cool thing about this rule set is this does allow you to put units in ambush. So they're hunkered down waiting for their next best available target to shoot at. Um, which can happen anytime during that turn. So uh, this will, again will be discussed in the shooting video because it really covers that. They're basically watching their field of fire and waiting for an opportunity to hit the unit uh, or an enemy unit as they come through. The next we have here is rally. And these we're going to talk about a little bit here as we go into the next segment of this video dealing with pinning. So if your unit is hammered down and have multiple pins on them, you can put your unit in rally. Um, basically, that's going to be used to remove some of those pins. You're taking a turn to get your guys in order to get the squad leader to give them a, a rousing motivational speech or threaten them to with whatever, to beat them within an inch of their life if they don't do what they're told to do. So... Again, this is used to remove pins. Um, you need to take a motivation test, which we will get into, to pass this one. Um, and then what happens after that is you get to remove D6 plus one pins from that unit if your motivation test is passed. And again, we'll get into that a little bit here as we get into more of the pinning. But this is useful, again, if you've got a unit that's been hammered and you just want to take a turn to hunker down and, and kind of recoup them a little bit to get some of those negative modifiers off them, this is what you would use. Down. So this is going to be explained a little bit in the shooting phase too, which I know seems kind of odd, but you'll understand here in a minute. So this is used if your unit has not taken, taken a turn. Um... And say they're getting shot at by something big that you don't want to deal with uh, that type of firepower. You can opt a unit to go down. What that does is the unit hits the dirt, hugs the earth, gets as small as possible. Um, that's going to give them cover bonuses when getting shot at. Um, so that really helps again in that case. Uh, or if you just want to put a unit down because there's really no other best option and you want to hunker them down because this does actually remove a pin if this is kept on for the next turn and I'll explain that again here in a little bit but you get a chance to remove some pins if you keep a unit down for molt for two turns in a row um, it, it's D3 pins you get to remove and uh, so again it helps in that aspect um, also this is what you would put down if a unit fails in order tests and again that's coming up here in a minute so stick with me um, but if a unit has, say, three pins on them and they have to, you want to get them to, to move or to shoot, you have to take a motivation test at minus however many pins they have on them. So if your motivation on a unit, say, is nine and you have three pins on you, you need a seven or, or um, better or lower to pass. If you roll an 11, you failed that order test. The unit has to go down. They don't understand the order, they're confused, they're beaten up, they're going down that turn. So um, that gives you a brief overview of the actual dice and what they do. Um, and we're going to, again, explain some of these in more detail. This will be covered in a shooting phase along with this. The advanced and run will be covered in movement phase. And we'll go into a little bit more about these when we get into pinning here in a second. Uh, one last thing I want to talk about is, so as I explained a little bit ago, at the end of the turn, once all dice are laid out by the units <clears throat> and out of the bag, you return all dice to the bag to continue for the next turn. All dice must go in the bag. However, you have the option to keep, and where are they, ambush and down out. If you choose that that unit is just going to sit and wait for the next best target and because there's troops coming up the road and you're just waiting for that turn, you can keep them in ambush. And keep that dice out of the bag, keep it next to the unit at the end of the turn. That's helpful for if you know they got to move across an open field next and you want to make sure you have first pop at them when they try to move, you can keep that ambush die down. You can keep a unit in ambush as long as you want. You got a machine gun team covering a road, keep an ambush the whole turn until they get an opportunity to fire. You can do that. Um, obviously, that's one less die you're going to have in the bag, but it keeps them uh, open for the first possible opportunity to fire. Down. And again, this will be discussed a little bit more in pinning. You can keep a unit down. If a unit's beaten up, you keep them down. Um, and then if you decide to keep that die by them, immediately at the end of that turn, you roll a uh, D3 and you remove that many pins. Um, and then that also helps if you know that unit's going to get hammered next turn because they got caught in an open road and there's nothing they can really do but hunker down until they get support. 
you can do that. You can keep a unit in down. Other than that, all of them would go back in the bag and you can go to the next turn, as I said. So in the next little clip here, we're going to talk a little bit about pinning. Um, and this plays an important role in the game system. Sometimes you don't have to kill a unit. Sometimes you just have to beat them enough that they're so pinned down that they can't do anything. Um, so we're going to get into that a little bit here in the next video. All right, let's talk about the effects of pinning. Uh, now, normally this happens when a unit is shot at, um, which you'll see again in detail when we get in the shooting video, but this really needs to be explained here because pins affect morale. It affects uh, following orders. Um, so it's, it's important that we just cover this now so you get a good basis of what pinning is all about. And you'll see when we get in the shooting video, moving video, how that can kind of affect different things. Um, but this will give you a good basis of it. So what, ha how do you get pinned? A unit will be pinned every time it is hit by a unit that is shooting at it. So if a unit fires at these guys, regardless of whether they take any wounds, they will take a pin. Um, some, some weapons as your heavy artillery or tanks or, you know, stuff like that, they will take multiple pins and it will say under the stat line, D3 pins, D6 pins, whatever it may be. So if a unit is shot at, it will take a pin regardless of wounds, regardless of how many die. There are times when there can be friendly fire. The unit will still take a pin every time it is, it is hit. Uh, so that that's easy if these guys get shot at and they get hit six times by whatever a squad hammered them and they get hit six times they only get one pin on them so say this unit is shot at and three guys get hit again you can use these are these are pretty cool little wheels you can use a d6 whatever it is they will only take that one pin so mark the squad however works for you so you remember that they have a pin on them so say one squad fires at him, does the three hits, no wounds, they're good to go. Another squad opens up on him, fires. They can take another pin. No matter how many squads fire at him, they'll get a pin for each unit firing at them for each turn. So if the entire uh, enemy force opens up on them, they're going to keep taking pins. So you can see how they stack up pretty quickly. That's only if they're hit. If something fires at them, and completely misses, then there's no pins. But it's one per unit firing at them, or uh, accruing hits on them. That's that's important to know. And again, some weapons do D6, D3, whatever it may be, you roll for it, you see how many pins they take. So, if a unit is pinned, they have two pins on them, how does that affect them? What affects them in following orders? Um, so, we didn't really get into it, but we're gonna get into it now. There are different morale levels for this system. When you're building your army, you can choose inexperienced, regular, or veteran. Real simple and easy. If your unit isn't inexperienced, they have a morale of eight, or leadership of eight, motivation of eight, whatever you want to call it, it's all the same. Of eight, a regular infantry unit will have a nine, a veteran will have a ten, very basic, very simple, very easy to keep track of. So this unit here is a unit of veteran finish. So they have two pins on them. Their normal motivation will be 10. It is now an eight. So if they pull an order die and I want these guys to fire, they can't do anything until they pass a motivation. So what that means is you would need 2d6 and I would need to pass an eight or better. So I roll, and of course I roll off camera. So there's an eight, so they just barely make it, they pass. So where that plays a role is, and again, we'll get into this a little bit more, but so if they pass a motivation with pins on them, all right, they're, they're hurting, but they're still able to follow orders. If they pass a motivation, they are allowed to do whatever you wanted them to do, and they lose one pin okay so they're starting to get their stuff together all right they're still understanding what's going on they're getting their head back in the game so they lose one pin they then they can do whatever they want now there are some penalties because they still have a pin on them here and we will get into that one and say when it comes to firing but that's really where it affects it um so that reduces a pin um 
And let me see here. So, yeah. So base, it's based off of your motivation. Now, if they would have rolled a nine with those two pins on them, they wouldn't be able to follow that order. They go, it always seems, there it is. They go down. And those pins stay on them. They failed. They're just, they're too shaken up. They're hammered. They don't know what's going on. Um, so they're just going to go down and that's basically all they can do for that time. Now, there's a special rule. If they are full strength still, say, okay, they rolled a nine. They needed a, they needed eight or better, but they're a full squad. They haven't taken any casualties yet. They can re-roll this motivation to see if they pass it. But to do that, the rule book specifically says it has to be a full squad of 10 or more. So some units allow you to take um, up to 12. Some units, you're only allowed like to finish. You're only allowed a max of nine guys for a full squad. So although they haven't taken any casualties and they're still at full squad, they can't re-roll this because they're not they're not a big enough squad to have that staying power to say, come on, let's, let's get moving and do this. Um, so that's, that's pretty effective in that, but it only has if 10 or more. Um, and as I said, if the unit fails it, it goes down. So if the unit is passed, one pin is removed. Um, now if this was a, say we're going to rally them, this is what we're going to talk about. So they have two pins on them and we decide to rally them. You would, Roll your, still have to roll for your motivation because they have a pin on them. However, you since you're rallying them, you would roll at your full motivation with no negative modifiers because of the pin. So, you roll the d6, and that's a 10. I'm sorry, that's an 8. These dice are hard to read. So, that's an 8. So, they pass. If that was a 9 or even a 10, do it that way, if that was a 10, they would fail. But say if it's a nine and I'm getting my stuff together here sorry guys say so it's nine it, it they're a uh, veteran so that's exactly what they would need they have two pins on them it doesn't matter they would pass it because you're rallying them and at that time like I said you would do d6 that's one plus one it would move both pins so pinning is super effective in possibly getting your units to not be able to do what you want them to do also, if say we go back to the original, they pass that motivation, they have a one, one pin left on them, and you wanted them to fire. <clears throat> there are still penalties in firing. So, because they have one pin on them, you would need a plus one to hit. And we'll get into this in shooting in detail, but I want to I cover this a little bit since we're talking about pinning. However many pins they have on them, that is a plus one harder to hit because they're still pretty shaken up. Uh, so, they're still not where they need to be, <coughs> excuse me, so it, it, it's a little bit harder to hit. Now, when we're rolling for motivation, there's two things to talk about here. We got what they call incredible courage and foobar. So if the order test rolls up with two snake eyes, we all know what snake eyes are, double ones, all right, and it wouldn't be two snake eyes, it'd be one snake eyes. Um, the unit immediately loses d6 plus one pins. All right, and it's called Incredible Courage. So if they have two pins on them and they roll that, it's boom, it's six, um, yeah, six plus one, so it'd be the seven pins. Immediately remove these six plus one. All right, and that's pretty important. Um, you know, if you're taking a long shot and these guys got, say, five pins on them and they're normally a nine motivation, you need a four or better, you're taking a, a, a big risk and trying to roll. If you roll snake eyes, boom, it's D6 plus one pins removed. So... Uh, that is a good gamble and a good chance to take at times. Now, on the opposite side of that, if you roll double sixes, no matter what, you have foobard. Uh, and for those who have the book, we're following page 42, there's a foobar chart. Basically, you try to give them an order and they are so messed up that they're just, they can't handle it. So, if you roll double sixes, you have to roll on the foobar chart. On a one or two, and again, I won't go super in detail on this, but on one or two, basically it's friendly fire. You look at, uh, if you got a friendly unit within 12 inches, they mistake them for an enemy, and you immediately do a shooting phase, basically on your own unit, uh, and you roll for damage as normal. So you can basically shoot at your own guys. 
uh, if it's a three, four, five, or six, they panic. And in that case, you would then have to give them a run order. So they go to run no matter how many pins they have on them. And they run away from the closest visible enemy unit. Uh, if there's none visible, if these guys are way in the back corner or there's no enemies that can be seen from any of these guys, they just go down instead. Um, but if they can see an enemy, they run away. Uh, now, the next turn, they don't continue to run. They would then at that turn pull an order dice for them and you can see what they can do at that point. But a uh, run order, you know, you're running 12 inches away. That can really affect your, your line if need be. So... Um, yeah, it, it, that could be pretty devastating. Um, for example, I had that happen to a uh, Panzer Shrek of mine who was sneaking up on a Churchill. They had one pin on him. They got right up within firing distance and were ready to hammer him. And they rolled double sixes and they ran. And that Churchill ended up devastating my line. So it, it happens and it happens at the worst time as always. So that's a real brief explanation of pinning. Um, like I said, it, it mainly affects, there's a brief overview here, it really does affect to be able to take orders. It affects firing. Um, they can accumulate pretty quick. You do have chances to get rid of them, um, but you risk either rolling out of motivation at a negative, or you can rally them, which then you lose them for that turn. Um, and the final thing I just want to brief again real quick is, as I said, they can go ambush or down. Um, so you can choose to do that if you would like. Um, to retain those orders, as we said, um, whereas everything else goes back in the dice. And where I'm bringing that up now is because if I choose, they have two pins on them, and I choose, you know what, I'm just going to have them go down this turn because, one, they're in a bad position. I don't know if they're going to pass that motivation. They're open enemy fire. I'm going to have them go down so it gives them better cover and keep it there. At the end of the turn, I decide, you know what, effectively, I don't need these guys for next turn because they're not really playing a big role in what my plan is for that turn. I can retain the down order. I can roll for the motivation. I'm sorry, I take that back. There is no motivation. I just decide that I'm keeping them down. That die stays out. You then immediately lose D3 pins. So those these two pins would go away. That down order still has to stay, but now they're down next turn under the safety of cover, hugging the earth without any pins on them. So then at the end of that turn, if I want to move again, I can put the dice back in the, in the back. But that does become effective if you only have two or three pins on them and you don't really need them for next turn, but you still want to make sure they stay safe and covered. You don't want to rally them because if they're in the open, they can still get hammered. So you just keep them down, make sure they have that cover, and um, still get a chance to remove some pins at the end. So that does become effective at that time. So again, that is a quick brief overview of pinning. Um, I think I covered everything. We'll cover it a little bit more. And where it plays a role in rolling when we get into motivation and shooting and all of that kind of stuff. I'm sorry, movement and shooting. Um, but that gives you a real brief idea how it works. You know, sometimes, as I said in the beginning of this, is it's better just to hammer a unit and put three, four, five pins on them. You don't have to kill anything, but if you want, you don't want that big bad Churchill, or that, that Tiger or the tank or whatever it may be, or even an infantry squad that can really put a hurting on you or a machine gun squad, sometimes putting pins on them is enough um, that effectively they can't do anything next turn uh, so it again it gives it that extra level that you don't have to kill everything on the on the board this helps you play the mission but still just as they would have effectively put pinning fire covering fire pinning fire whatever you want to call it on a unit to be able to still effectively move around them without having to worry about them so uh it's it's pretty cool little added way of playing the game so next we're going to wrap up with a little bit talking about officers um, and some of the bonuses that they incur um, and finish up the video. Okay guys, we're going to finish up this video here, the last part, talking about headquarter units. Um, and I just want to talk about them here because it deals with morale bonuses and, and extra action orders and that kind of stuff. So I'm going to cover it now. Um, I'm not going to cover in detail some of the choices you have simply because that all again will be covered under different videos um, but for those following along who have the book we're on page 82 dealing with headquarters units so the first we're going to talk about is your officer here is my lieutenant my finished lieutenant um, you can play them as you know whatever you want so you have your mandatory choices are a lieutenant whether it be a first or second lieutenant to lead your platoon 
you can then have another optional slot where you can take a captain or a major. Um, obviously, at a platoon level, if a captain or major is there, either your mission is so important they need somebody there to rank, or they don't trust your LT to cover the mission and they're there to make sure the job gets done. Um, so where that comes into play is, again, you can have a second lieutenant, a first lieutenant, a captain, or a major. Why are officers important? Well, one, they give you a morale bonus to anybody within a bubble. What that is, is a second lieutenant would give a plus one morale, a first lieutenant is going to give a plus two, a captain a plus three, a major a plus four. So where that bubble is for a lieutenant, first or second, anybody within six inches has that plus one whatever it be, morale, whether it be a plus one or a plus two. So as we said, these guys are, say, a veteran squad of nine. They have two pins on them, making them a seven. He's a second lieutenant within six inches, or first lieutenant, I'm sorry, we'll say within six inches. That pretty much negates the two pins because he gives a plus two bonus. So that really does play a role in that bubble, you know, if you want him to lead the charge or if you want him to stay back. Um, obviously, was he, if he was a major, that's a plus four. Um... <clears throat> Excuse me. That's a plus four, and he has a 12-inch bubble. So again, that plays a, a big role. Now, um, I didn't cover this. I forgot to cover this when talking about motivation. A motivation can never be better than a 10. So uh, when we're dealing with that, you know, you'll only have a plus whatever it may be to cover uh, to cover that bubble. So. You know, if these guys are a 9 and he gives a plus 4, you're not getting a plus 13. So, that does play a role in that aspect of it. Um, so, you do have to remember that, that it's never greater than the 10. Um, so, yeah, ten, 10 or less. So, that does play a role in that aspect of it. So, he gives a good morale bonus to that. So, that's a good thing to keep in track. You know, if, if you want him... If these guys are severely pinned and you still want them to follow an order, activate your lieutenant first, get him over within that, that bubble, so then he gives that uh, bonus to it. Where that also plays a role for an officer, they have the chance to do extra orders in something called SNAP2. And this is pretty important. So, as we said, we pull random dice. So you pull a dice and it's one of yours, you decide that you're going to use it on your lieutenants. And again, I play him as a first lieutenant, so we're just going to use that as a base here. First lieutenant. He has the option to snap to anybody within that bubble. So if he's within six inches of these two units, he can snap to and give extra commands at that moment to those units. Again, it depends on your rank of your officer. A second lieutenant has one extra order. First Lieutenant 2, Captain 3, Major 4, and increases by 1. Again, it's very basic. How that works is you can give him any any command except for down, obviously. Um, and he snaps 2. If they got 2 units within 6 inches, at that time, it's the only time you can look in a dice bag. Well, not the only time. We'll get into when you actually lose the unit. But you will go into the dice bag and pull 2 more dice for a First Lieutenant, 1 for a Second, 3 for a Captain, 4 for a Major. You pull those dice, and then now you can give three orders in that turn before your opponent pulls another die. You can um, do them in any sequential order, but you have to finish one first. So say if I want to move him first, I'm going to run him, whatever the case may be, um, fire and put him in ambush, whatever his, his order is. You complete his order, then you pick the next one, and you complete their order. Then you do the next one, and you complete their order. Once all three are done, it's done. So... He's very helpful if you're trying to get off a massive assault or you really need to pin a unit. You can snap to a machine gun and put covering fire and then move these guys up to where they need to be or have these guys fire too. Um, I've seen some people use it and I've used the tactic myself is I'll put him back with say two artillery pieces in an artillery park and snap to and get me to fire both artillery. You know, sequential of course, but get to fire both artillery right away before people move or whatever the case may be. Um, and basically effectively putting a lot of covering fire on the table. So snapping two is super effective if it is done right. Um, and again, it's it's fairly easy to do it right. So, uh, but yeah, it, I mean, it, 
it's again, and I keep saying it over and over again, but it's effective because now you, you really get to use it. Now, I wouldn't always recommend using it just to put pull extra die out because now you're shorting yourself in the bag if you don't absolutely need them that turn. But it can be really effective to put a good assault down or to get him over here to rally these guys now um, so they can do whatever they need to do. So that is how an officer works. Um, in the headquarters section, they also cover medics. And unfortunately, I don't have a medic to show you how that works. But uh, basically, you'd have one model as a medic. Um, and he can do exactly what he's supposed to do. He can heal guys. So if he's over here and within six inches of this unit, and this unit gets shot and one of the guys gets wounded, the medic is within six inches. You roll D6 on a six. That hit is ignored. Simple as that. He patches him up. Um, it's very basic. Now the rules do state about Geneva Convention where your medic cannot be armed, it cannot shoot or anything like that. So he will not get an extra die in your bag because he would be a unit. But again, if you're having two units assault, you throw him in the smack dab middle. You have two units assaulting. It can help you effectively ignore wounds. It's a six up, so it's a long shot. But I have seen it work. It works well. Um, the next two things we're going to talk about real quick briefly are a forward artillery observer and uh, that you can have um, basically put down artillery barrages. The Brits get one for free and we'll cover it more in the firing section but you can have an artillery observer, one guy, he can have up to two support guys with him so these guys are with him also. Uh, and he gets a chance to put an artillery bombardment marker down on the table and call in an artillery bombardment. Or he can call in a smoke barrage. If you really want to cover a good good size of the table with smoke, you can do that also. You then can also have a forward air observer. Acts almost the same as an artillery barrage, except he's calling in an airstrike. And there's some charts on that that we will get into again in the shooting phase. Um, because the artillery can become super effective. I've seen it happen quite often. Again, uh, the Brits get one for free as one of their special rules, and my son uses it, and it can be pretty devastating. So we'll cover that in shooting a little bit, but those are two, two other models that are covered in the headquarters section that you can add to your army um, to effectively give you an extra bombardment. Now, it only works one time, one turn, um, so you got to plan and decide when you want to do it, but it gives you that extra beefiness. So that's it. That's a brief summary of the bolt action rule set along with some specifics of what makes the game system unique getting into the order dice and the pinning and things of that nature. So I really appreciate you guys watching. Um, please feel free to comment, uh, shoot us a message, whatever the case may be. I know I'm not a super expert. I'm sure there's people out there that have been playing a lot longer than me that can maybe correct a little bit of things that I may have said wrong. Um, it's one thing to know the rules and to play, but then I'm trying to get in front of a camera and remember everything. So, um, again, please comment if you like what you saw. If you didn't like what you see, be gentle. Um, but go ahead and comment. Uh, and again, thanks for watching. The next video is going to be on movement. The next three to four videos should not be as long as this one. This one was a little more in detail, um, but we're going to cover movement. Um, everything from infantry to vehicles to artillery to anything obviously dealing with movement. Um, wrapping into some penalties and stuff that we've learned from the first video here with, with pinning and, and things of that nature. So uh, I hope you liked it. Please stay tuned for the next. And um, again, if you like what you're seeing coming from Coal Legion, uh, please subscribe to the page. We're going to start putting out a lot of stuff here as we get rolling, uh, not just from myself, but from Eric, Matt, Steve, some of the other uh, guys here and um, quite a bit of things. So we've got some big things planned for Coal Legion. So please stay tuned, subscribe. And thanks for watching and happy gaming.